So we're, we're revisiting the apostolic and seeing its application for us moving into 2018. And uh, I hope to arrange to have a considerable number of extra conversations today, which I hope to have um, spoken with Chris and the technical team about getting this place. I wonder why I'm so you can access it. It's really important to try to go through these things. So that's what we're looking for. So understanding apostolic books, this is the important thing in context of the term is the message. Yeah. And being in an apostolic context, there's some things, things about our message we need to make sure we understand. So that one seems we don't worry about that. What is it this notion of life? Now I want to, this is a, a quote, God speaking from two way conversations, Sunday the 17th of December. God said this, he said, things are speeding up, and the inference was that after he sped up, it now has to be my timetable, not yours as a member of the generation. And this has an important, I want you to take notice of this. It's very important in terms of what God was talking about in the apostolic. I, that's God, want all the generation need to revisit their timetable of life and seek me to find out how that timetable should be drawn up. It's not about what you think is important. And the emphasis is it's not just you working out your priorities. I want you to allow me to determine your priorities and your timetable. That's why I want you, that's the emphasis again, allow me sense of that's why I want you to allow me because it's not about what you think is important. Allow me to fill in the timetable and make the pieces fit together. Let me be the software for the timetable that I the generation to be born in the generation. Um, what was talking to me in the context of when I was principal at school, we had someone who used to do the timetable and after a while the person within the timetable was sort of like you got the power you need to you get the little nuances of what happened. I mean, you might get a, a last period Friday for the worst class in the school or anything like that. In a sense, <laughs> you would probably you could probably influence that just by the way things worked out. I'm not saying any person did that, I'm just trying to illustrate the sort of power of the timetable. They could even sort of say, look, we can't make certain combinations occur so this subject can't happen. There'd be things like that that, that, that would be giving power to the timetable. And I would every year say, let's get, let's get some software, let's, let's do it this way. And there's this continued resistance to doing it because the person believed that they could do it better than the software. Well, what God is saying to us is, let him do the software. Let him, can you allow him to be the timetable of your life? That's really what he's saying. Now, that gets scary. So allowing him to determine how, 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 how the timetable, the timetable determines what happens. In the school context, the timetable determines what subjects, when they occur, how often they occur, and often who is going to teach them. That's how significant the timetable is. So when he's using the word timetable, he's actually using a very precise word. But he didn't say priorities. He said timetable. Timetable. Very, very precise. Now, we looked at a number of things relating to, to um, the apostolic and, and Dr. Woodrock was leading to that. And, and this you understand, but I want to emphasize again it's important to understand the twofold ministry because it's given to equip saints and to edify the body of Christ. Until, until we reach maturity, the measure of which is the fullness of Christ. So when we can demonstrate that nature and stature of Christ in the earth, we have reached maturity. But we, I'm not just, I'm just this church, but 
the body of Christ, when the body of Christ can demonstrate the nature and stature of Christ in you, that's maturity. And that's what the fivefold ministry that Paul talks about in Ephesians, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors are given for. It's given for that purpose to bring the saints to maturity. And that maturity will be measured by a demonstration of the nature and stature of Christ in the field. So key terms involve things like equipping, knowledge, knowledge of who God is and what he wants, unity, but we use the term sometimes non-aloneness. Non-aloneness, that's why it was important. The thing had to be built, but it had to be built with a number of people. We had to involve as many people as possible because that's how God wants it built. Relationship, including collaboration, maturity of faith. They're key terms when we're talking about the other stuff. Um, and all that bit up there, that was important about this. Fourth statement, Congress, and therefore Generation B, emphasis is to equip and build the saints. Why? Because we want to make the saints, want the saints to be strong, because that's what Paul said it was there for, and to enable the saints to carry the in other words, it's us as saints, not us as leaders or anything else. It's not the apostles or the evangelists that do the work. It's the saints. The job of the evangelists is to keep the saints to evangelize. And in Romans 1 11, Paul said, I long to visit you, that I might impart some spiritual gift to you to make you strong. We want to impart something to the Romans. And, and um, we, uh, we spoke about that to impart a spiritual gift to make you strong. We found that any impartation in it is a strength, we call it establishment, and that word is all used to make you strong. So Rizzo was to make it stable, to strengthen, and to fix in a position. So the whole thing is that. The apostolic, only the fivefold ministry we're talking about, the apostolic is given to make it strong. Now, I want us not to think in present tense, I want us to think in past tense. The apostolic has been given to us, we have been strengthened and set in position and made strong. I say that because we have had apostolic connection for 15 years. So you don't think about this as this is something. I think this is something that we see. Maybe something we need to unpack. But it's something that we see. Now, there's a term used in the apostolic dimension. The apostolic dimension is the widespread distribution of apostolic grace to the general body of Christ to stabilize its strength. We all function in that. We're not all apostles. I'm not an apostle. But we are part of the relationship with the apostle and come into that apostolic dimension. And we've received that apostolic grace. And that's the, that's the goal, to give that, that grace. And then grace stabilizes and strengthens. And it causes significant apostolic characteristics such as spiritual maturity, knowledge, and ability to function generally in the life of the individual believer. That's what you already have. Doesn't matter whether you've been here 15 years or 15 months or 15 weeks. Or 15 days, you come into that connection. This is what you come into. This apostolic dimension, this apostolic dimension causes significant apostolic characteristics to come upon the believer. That means that each saint is empowered to flow in apostolic characteristics in your family, in your family, in your work, in your recreation, wherever you might be. In your own lives, in a very, very practical way, you have been empowered with these characteristics. It's good to remind us about this, not sort of think, oh no, I don't know, but actually be empowered with these characteristics. And it should be able to in a very practical way. Now, core thing, this is what we got up to last week. Core thing, the ap apostolic apostle means the sent one. Means the same one. I'm told that in, in um, 
increasingly with something called lobinobolosis. Polos or something like that. Sink, mind, host. Okay. So the apostle means the sink one. It's a core definition. And this is a core scripture. And Jesus speaking said this in John 434. It's interesting. He explained. He's explaining something to us. My nourishment. My food comes from doing <coughs> the will of God. My nourishment, my food, what sustains me, comes from doing the will of God. Who sent me, and it comes from finishing his work. So he says, what nourishes me, what motivates me, what drives me, is to do the will and finish the work of him who sent me. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what, this is what sustains me. This is what keeps me going. It's interesting because Jesus had lots of distractions. The Jews would have loved him. To, they would have accepted him as Messiah if he said this other thing about this. They would have taken him to With his miracles, they would have said, Man, this is your one. But he wasn't sent to do that. That's what they wanted. And the apostolic doesn't do, it's not there to meet our needs, it's not there to do what we want, it's not there to do what we need. You know, it's not there for us, well, that's what people expect of us. It's not that, it's simply to do the will of him who sent us. So, as an apostolic people, we are a sent people. And our task is to simply do what God wants us to do. Now, I found this encouraging. What, what we are doing. Explain why the name Mary and I are going to go through all the prophecies. I mean, you've got prophecies for some of you guys as well, so that will be the training for the next one. But in Trinidad in 2003, Steve Schultz, you call me, you've heard of Steve Schultz, one of the other prophetic um, team within leadership within Congress, and some of you have met him, and you can see the prophecy from this is what Steve Schultz said in 2003. I saw these wires coming out of your ears. He's speaking to me. Speaking to Mary and I. I saw these wires coming out of your ears. And the Lord is saying, Son, I want you, I want you to hear me with greater clarity. You are not going to wonder and wonder whether you are hearing from God, but he is saying, I'm giving you surety in your heart and a clarity in your understanding that you are going to know that you. And by this stage, I thought I said we've got it really well. There was a time back in the 19, mid 80s, I remember when I first came into Pentecost and I heard the Lord saying, God said this to me, God said that to me. God so busy speaking to you, I didn't have to speak to me. But Lord, I'd love to be able to hear you, I'd love to be able to know when you're talking. I said, listen for hours, is this God or is this not? So it was always my desire. So by 2003, I thought I was hearing from God pretty well. I heard God on lots of, lots of things. And then I heard God say, give me the church. He's done that. So all those things, I thought I was hearing from God pretty well. That's <coughs> what he was saying. You're not going to wonder, wonder whether you're hearing from God, but he's saying, I'm putting assurance in your heart and clarity and understanding that you are going to know that you know. And this is important. This is not for me. This is important for you guys. <coughs> Given to me for you. That's really how this works. You have had problems in times past, and the Lord will allow this season to break that in you because it was misplaced. Okay, so it is something. And I see the brokenness is now, is over now, and I'm going to renew the silver horror of people. You are going to proceed in confidence, not confidence in yourself. Your ability, but confidence in my plan, my will, my purpose. That's an apostolic thing. Does that sound like an apostolic religion? Does that sound like a sentence? This is what he's saying. You are going to be able to proceed with confidence, but confidence in yourself and your ability to confidence in my plan, my will, my purpose, son, and I am connecting directly to going to press forward with greater strength, greater confidence, knowing that. This is 
as Jesus said, I only do the things I see my Father do. The same type of appointments that should be reported to him in his direction. You guys always struggle with all that going through the word, but when he got the word up to the church, he wanted to walk with him before, and then he ran. This is prophetic word. Then he went out for where he needs to go. So, it's really important that we understand this passage fully because it's really, really important we understand this as we press into these things because, see, we don't get external validation. And we don't need external give God's validation because we're only doing what God said and, and whatever that is I said last week we drive past and I'll go back to the week and decide to think about that before. but where the Lord the Lord wants us to have a full car park and what he has said he just said this is what I want you to do the goal is not a full car park it's not, not the next word but the words of God says God love them and God bless them and let it increase. But we don't have anything. We can't say the car park is full. <clears throat> Stop smiling, Dan, just because it's true. <laughs> <clears throat> now, we got up to, Mal we will jump up to number 24, if you wouldn't mind, not 15. No, 21, I'm sorry, as, as you said. Yeah. Now, four streams of understanding that comes out of this. The core motivation, Jesus' food was to do the will of him who sent him. So his will is what nurtures us. That's a key point. And that's our core motivation. Secondly, executing heavenly intent, the will of God. We build what God wants, not what we want or think. We've got to build what God wants. There's no personal preferences. We're receiving a divine command, so we're being sent. And we've got a commitment to completion. That raises some questions. What is the divine command for us? Some serious questions there. We've got to look at that. That's, in fact, to answer that question, that's why we went back to the prophetic words and said, what is the divine command for us? <clears throat> now, what does it mean for you and what does it mean for me? What does it mean for us? Being sent... First of all, understand this, being sent is different to coming up with good ideas or being liked by others or even having a full car park. We have received the apostolic dimension through our connection with Dr. to the apostolic through Dr. Woodrow for 15 years. Therefore, we have the capacity of a sent people. Understand the logic? We've received the general the, the apostolic dimension for 15 years because we've been rightly connected to an apostolic source. So we've received the apostolic characteristics. The apostolic characteristics, because Jesus was the picture, is I do the will of him who sent me. So each of us has that capacity to do what God's will is, not what our preferences is. Therefore, ipso facto, we can willingly allow God to set our life timetable. You can actually say, okay, God, hands off, you write the timetable. And that's the challenge I want to put before each one of us, that we have to be willing to say, God, hands up, hands off, you write the timetable of my life, just as we believe you've been writing the timetable of this church. But again, hands off, you write the timetable for this church because we are a sent people and our only purpose is to do your will. Oh, there's some transaction things we looked at. Okay, so what we're going to do now is to look at the four components of ascending. And we're going to spend about 15 minutes listening to what Dr. Woodruff says about those things. Thanks, Mel. <clears throat> Identify four streams of truth or or four streams of understanding that we can extract from that statement from Jesus. And remember, in doing that, we're looking into the components of the mission of Jesus, looking into his heart, and trying to find in the life of Jesus patterns that we then import into our Congress, systems that we will live by and walk by and build our ministries by. Jesus said in John 4.34, my food is to do the will 
of him who sent me and to finish his work. So number one, he defines his core motivation. He says, it is my food. Well, your food keeps you alive. Your food is the, the, the point at which you get nurtured. It's the point at which you receive life. That is his core motivation. He calls it my food. So the core motivation of Jesus is to do the will of him who sent him. And that's the core motivation of our Congress. We want to be like Christ. And I'm rehearsing these things so that pastors coming into the Congress, leaders coming into the Congress, get very clear understanding of the nature of the environment that you're stepping into and what we have built over decades and what we stand in. This is our food. This is what keeps us alive. This is what nurtures every member of the core leadership council, nurtures every member of our regional coordinators, nurtures every member of our executive attaches and all our senior elders across the earth. We define our core motivation as Jesus did. And our core motivation is to do his will. Well, Jesus talks about executing the heavenly intent. He talks about the will of God, executing the heavenly intent. Heaven has an intent. We don't make things up upon the earth. We don't create things and then offer them unto God. We find out what is God's intent and we build those things upon the earth. That's what Jesus is saying. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Or you can hear Jesus saying, I'm not creating anything upon the earth. I'm not inventing anything. I'm not having any dream spasms. I have no personal preferences, but I am executing the heavenly intent. Thirdly, Jesus talks about receiving divine command. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. He talks about receiving divine command, something coming down from heaven, a command of God that's received in the earth, uh, coming from uh, command and control, instructions flowing downward from the mind of God into the hearts of his servants in the earth. The fourth thing he describes, he talks about his commitment to completion, or we can call that finishing. Commitment to completion. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. To finish his work. So what are the four things? Defining of our core motivation. Executing our heavenly intent. Receiving the divine command. And a commitment to completion. These are four very powerful components of the sent dimension of the apostolic. And we want to find those things in our Congress also and embed these things in the heart of every senior elder and every leader in our Congress. Define your core motivation. Be committed really to executing the heavenly intent. And that has an impact upon how you see the vision of your church. Uh, whether it's something that you created on the earth or whether you went to God and said, why does this church exist? What is your mission? What is your intent? How do you want us to be? How should this church be named? What is the mission from heaven for my life? Executing the heavenly intent. Receiving of the divine command. And of course, the word command is linked to obedience. Uh, it is linked to alacrity. It is linked to movement and momentum. Receiving the divine command. And a commitment to completion. You will hear a lot in this apostolic environment about finishing, about completing what God has given us to do. So this is very important in the sent dimension of the apostolic. I'm going to focus on that a little bit because this issue of being sent, of being sent on a mission, is very, very different from the, the general attitude in Christianity of people coming up with good ideas and, and trying to be like somebody else and let me get my church to be like this person's church or I read a book that somebody said and I want to be just like them. Uh, in, in this Congress, we, we deal first of all with God. What does God want? He sent us. And the one who sends you has some sort of idea, has a plan. And we start with the mind of God. Now, there are four components to ascending. Four components to ascending. And we can say in every sending, there is, first of all, command. Then there is movement. There must be direction, and there must be destination. Command, movement, direction, destination. So I'm going to look at those words and shift those words just a little bit. Command or purpose. Command or purpose. If you are sent, 
there must be a command. And that command then puts purpose into your life. Command or purpose. Movement, let's say, when there is movement, there must be momentum. Momentum is the force of movement. Direction, if there is direction, you have to have a vision. You can't have direction and wandering around with no idea of where you're going. So if there's direction in your life, there must be vision. And let's say destination, we used this word before, destination or finish. So now we have four new definers. In every sending, there must be purpose, momentum, vision, or finish. We want to see that in our Congress, and I want that to come into your life. Not only your community life as a senior elder leading a kingdom community, but you want that in your family. You want this in your own individual life. Your family must have purpose, momentum, vision, and a sense of going towards a destination, finish. So let's look into each one of those four components and uh, look into them in our movement to comprehend the apostolic calling. First of all, we are looking into command or purpose. When you are sent, you cannot be sent unless there is a command. And that command comes from an external and higher rank that is above you and rearranges your personal priorities. You know, you can imagine a general in an army calling a private who is a very lower level soldier. And he, he shouts at this private, go get me my car. Immediately, that private is in, in motion. Uh, his own personal preferences are now rearranged. He may have had something that he wanted to do for himself. But now the command of the general has come upon his life. And it rearranges his personal priorities. And that's a very important element of, of being sent, uh, which is the apostolic impartation. Uh, when God releases an apostolic impartation, the apostolic impartation creates an environment that is no longer what I want or what I want to do. What is my idea? It creates an environment in which the emphasis is what do you want, God? What is your preference? What is your will? So there is a death to self-will. When the command comes, self dies. And uh, there comes a new sight of what is the will or what is the preference of the sender who is God. So the command comes from outside of yourself. It comes from a higher rank. It must come from above you, otherwise it would be a suggestion. Once there is a command, it is outside of you from a higher rank, and it rearranges personal priorities. In ascending, there is a clear declaration of the will of the sender and a removal of doubt and confusion. Your doubts and confusion are removed because the one who sent you tells you exactly what he wants. You are left in no state of confusion. You're not wondering. There's no duality. Uh, in an apostolic environment, people are very focused. Your eye, as the Bible says, is single and therefore full of light. Because in ascending, where there is command, there is a clear declaration of the will of the sender and thus a removal of doubt and confusion. And thirdly, we can say, the one who is sent receives authority from the sender. And you can imagine uh, a, a general commanding a private and say, go get me my car. And this guy's off to get the general's car. And along the way, he meets a major, a lesser rank than the general, but still higher than the private. And the major says, come here, private. I've got something I want you to do. And the private says to the major, there's no way I can do that right now. I have a higher command upon my life. I have to go get the general's car. And so the authority of the general has come upon that private. And that's the only context in which he can tell the major that he's not going to do right now what the major wants, simply because the higher authority of the general is now resting upon his life. And of course, the general in this uh, uh, example is God. The private is us, and the major is the devil. And when the command of God is upon our life, we have the authority to back off the devil, to refuse to do what he wants, to break his systems, and to obey the command of God. So command of purpose is a very powerful thing. And this impregnates the whole world of the Congress. And in coming into Congress WBN, you enter into a world of divine command, of the world of divine purpose, and thus into a world of authority to bring forth what God wants. And this is an integral part of the apostolic also. Number two, let's talk about movement or momentum. 
Where there is ascending, there is movement. And ascending gives force to your movement or creates what we call a journey with clear intent. A journey with clear intent. Because you have been sent, you're not just wandering. You're not just wishy-washy. You're now moving forward with force. And that force is called momentum. In our Congress, we call the unstoppable nature of that movement the bulldozer anointing. That's what we call it, the bulldozer anointing. It means you push down everything, all resistance of the enemy that stands before us. We break through every resistance, every barrier. And I hope in hearing that, that a measure of strong faith is rising up into you. Because many of you have been resisted. Many of you have been blocked by the enemy. You have been sidetracked and diverted and blunted, and you have been intimidated. But this is a new day. The grace of the apostolic has come upon your life. And that bulldozer anointing, as it were, is now coming upon you. And the momentum of God will begin to come upon your life as you come deeply into your world of the Congress. Uh, momentum creates boldness and it creates force of conviction in the one who has been sent. So ascending gives you boldness. And boldness is not arrogance. Boldness is a very good thing. Back in the early days in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, in the early days of the church in Jerusalem, the early apostles were intimidated by the resistance against them. And they went before God and they prayed for boldness and the Holy Spirit fell upon them and shook the house in which they were praying. It was God saying, yes, I'll give you boldness. In order to do my apostolic work, you have to be bold. And so let's believe God in our hearts for that boldness coming in. In fact, let's lift our hands right now, everyone around the world, and let's just pray and believe God for that. So Father, we, we pray as we receive the grace of the apostolic coming in. We pray for that impartation of boldness, just like our brothers received back in the early days. A boldness that gave them a bulldozer anointing, the strength to break through all obstacles, to break through all resistances, to refuse to be intimidated by the enemy and we cancel the intimidation around our new senior elders all across the earth and we break the power of the enemy to resist them as we release the force and the conviction and the momentum of the apostolic grace into their hearts and lives. Receive that right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's look at number three. The third component of, the, of ascending is direction or vision. Vision gives direction to movement. Without vision, all movement is simply wandering without a purpose. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14 to 17 from the New King James, uh, God is speaking to, to Abraham. And Abraham has just separated himself from Lot. Lot represents false vision. And this is what God says to Abram. He's telling Abram how to come into vision. And this is God speaking. So this is powerful and very authentic. And God says to Abram, he says, lift up your eyes from the place where you are. Lift up your eyes from the place where you are. So you have to know where you are located. Really clear analysis of where you are right now is important. Uh, not fooling ourselves. God, I'm in a place of weakness. God, I've been in a place where I have no idea what is the journey forward. God, I was in a place of frustration. We have to decide where we are. And from that place, you lift up your eyes. All that you see, God says, I will give to you. All that you see. Look at the sheer power of vision. When God commands us to lift up our eyes, all that you see I, God, will give to you. And then God says, arise and walk through the length and width of the land, for I give it to you. You see the components of the movement into vision. First of all, lift up your eyes in God. Look around. God, what do you want me to see? What is your will? What is your preference for my ministry? What is your preference for my church? I am willing to move away from what I have built. Move away from where I am. Tell me, show me the new things that you want. Everything you see, God by faith 
we can appropriate by faith. I will give you. What you see, you will, you will get. What God shows you is yours to inherit. But then there's a process. You have to arise. Arise means elevate yourself. Go to the next level. Next level of wisdom, next level of sight, next level of character, next level of leadership, next level of relationship, arise and walk. That's a process. It doesn't come immediately. Come step after step after step. Do the first thing, then the second thing. Then the third thing, start the movement forward, start the progression. It'll take some time, but God will bring you into the fullness of what he wants. Arise and walk through the length and breadth, for I give it to you. And in your hearts, you can be saying, I will walk through the length and breadth of the land that God has allocated for me. That's part of our movement in the apostolic also. So let's have vision, uh, people all around the world. Uh, as we have come into an apostolic environment, God has brought us here. And the third component of ascending is direction of vision. We are learning about the power of the apostolic. Number four, a uh, fourth component is destination or finish. A focus on the finish frees us from deception along the way. Yeah, if you know where you're going, you're not going to turn aside. You will not take the off-ramp on, on your purpose. You will not get sidetracked into self. You will not get sidetracked into popularity or into sin. Uh, once that vision, once that focus on the finish is there in front of you, uh, a finish focus, a focus on the finish frees us from deception along the way. A focus on the finish increases accuracy because arrival, we, in the Congress we say, arrival is an exact science. You do not go home to somebody else's house. You don't arrive on the street where you live and just turn into the first driveway and go home to the first house, kiss another man's wife and say, hi, honey, I'm home. You're not home until you're home. You have not arrived until you have arrived at the exact and the correct place. So that focus on the finish increases accuracy. So receive that accuracy in our hearts, that movement or that impartation of God that brings us the capacity to arrive at a more accurate place. Uh, focus on the finish or destination is, uh, allows us to validate God. God is the sender and he's validated and honored when we fulfill his commands or when we finish. So finishing doesn't only complete the purpose. Finishing validates and honors the sender and the sender is God. So these are very important components of the apostolic grace. And all of these characteristics that we have talked about in this session describe what comes to you in an apostolic environment. These components of an apostolic sending describe necessary and vital dimensions of a Congress leader and a kingdom community in Congress WBN. So remember, we talked about the calling of an apostle. But I want to remind you as we come to a close that what God gives to an apostle is not designed for the apostle. It is designed to be distributed to the people that are connected to him. The apostolic grace is yours. It is your possession. It is your inheritance. God brought you into Congress, WBN, and the resources of the apostolic grace that he designed and gave from heaven to me and to members of the core leadership council and to the leaders of the Congress were designed to be touched, to be used, to be owned by you, senior elder. You are not an apostle, but you have a right to receive apostolic grace. And all of these characteristics I've described are now yours to flow through your life to whatever dimension or degree that is ordained by God. So open your hearts and, and let the, the impartation of the apostolic from heaven flow through you, reconfigure your personal grace, come down into your life, change your family, change your personality, change your life, and change your church, and bring you into a much more powerful and accurate place in God. Where well, we're looking forward to these times of transformation ahead. I want you to sit in the Congress global entry process with great joy and with a great amount of hope in your hearts, not just be academic, not just write the information down. But I want you to receive the joy of the impartation of this and the sense of newness breaking from heaven upon your hearts and your lives. This is your day of change.
And so, Father, we thank you for the apostolic grace which came from you. You are the source of it. Everything that flows in the Congress came from you. It was not created by a human being. It was not designed by a man. It was designed by the will of God, given to men to be distributed right down through the Congress. And we celebrate the power of the apostolic dimension. And my prayer is that this great grace, this great gift from God flows down into the hearts of every senior elder all around the world listening to my voice right now as I speak. May the grace of God flow into your hearts and flow into your families and flow deep down into the hearts of the saints of your churches. And may it continue to increase upon you in days to come. Thank you, Father. We thank you for it. Amen. So any general comments? Is there any general reaction to that? Uh, my microphone is on. It just needs to be beefed up. Kath, can we zip this across to Kath, please? <clears throat> He just, he just forgot one little thing about food. It's not just nourishment. It's actually really fun. So let's put the fun back into food. I mean, doing the Sorry, can you fun. start again? I, I was um, having some earring problems. Yeah, okay. I was just Thank thinking um, when he's, he was talking about food and its nourishment yep. and all that. And it's like, yeah, okay. But it's also fun. Like, I enjoy food. Eating yep. is fun. Yep. So, surely there should be fun as well in doing the will of the Father. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Jesus was a pretty happy bloke, really. I think raising people from the dead, that would be a pretty big rush. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, <laughs> I, I have no complaints about the level of fun in my life, doing mm. God's will. Mm. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, just going further from Kath there, I was thinking I could listen to this man all day. And then I thought, but he's so serious. <laughs> Honest. Uh, he's, he's just so, I don't know the other word, serious. But yet, it, yeah, it is intense. But yet the words that come out of his mouth and then, you know, as, as I go thinking in my life and everything, I thought, yeah, the, the advice, if you like, the, the, the path to follow, it's, that's the part that, I mean, I could listen to him all day. Okay, this is, this is very interesting. Now, because, see, the, the important thing is I want to know what you're hearing. This guy, when he talks, he's now, he's, he's actually short. You, you're getting a 36-minute presentation when he will normally do two, two hours. The first half hour, you'll be rolling in laughter. Okay, he is a funny, those of you who you know exactly what I'm talking about, he is a very, very funny man. He really is. But he's deliberately shortened this down and there's an intensity. But see, it's picking up what's actually being said is the important. Oops, here we go again. Okay, so don't, don't allow what you saw as a pre to miss the core thing of what this is about. Any other comments? Yes, Marina, thank you. I felt what he was saying was so important that I would like that clip at home to listen to well you'll times. be able to download it okay it'll be and, yeah, that'll and, be possible and i also realized how purposeless my life has been it may not be like that from god's side but i have often felt oh, i'm just sort of sliding through life without well anything. we'll we'll come to that we'll come to that in a minute i'm deliberately showing is incidentally you went through all this when you did the bsm you know, this, you presented all this. 
Did I? Oh, yep. I, I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, of course, you, yeah, you've forgotten. That's okay. And we've done this a few times. But I, like you, I'm finding every time I watch it, I'm going, woo, woo. That's why I want it loaded up on OneDrive so everyone can access it. Um, see, there's, there's a few little key things. I, I just want to just highlight now, and this is as far as we can go because our time is up. But getting clarity on what our purpose is. You see, I can say, yes, our purpose is to do everything that God wants. And that, that in general terms is to, rate, is to become a finishing generation that can walk off this earth. And if it's not us, to pass it on to the next generation so that God doesn't have to start all over again with another generation. Now, that's, whoa, okay, how do we do that? Well, then you start to break it down and the very specific things that God is asking this church to do, and it's quite clear, there's some very, very, very specific things as we go through this, you will see. And I have no doubt as I marry in all the prophetic words that people like um, the Lishkis and the Wixes and the Williamses have received, that they will very much fit into what... Um, what else God has been saying is a consistency. But there's also some other things. I want you to be encouraged in this. I mean, most of you are familiar with the big things about leadership and youth and, and being a multicultural community and generating kingdom wealth. And, and you're probably familiar with most of those. But, you know, going right back in 1989... The guy, Paul Collins, who was the man who, from whom he was the apostolic birther of the stream that this church was birthed in. Okay, a guy called Paul Collins. And he prophesied over Mary and I in 1989, down in the, in the year one in the school building, and said that you would be a mother and father to hurting people. Now, at that point, Mary is sick as a dog. And there was no way known she was going to be a mother and father to hurting people. It was impossible. We were talking about this on the way in this morning. It was actually impossible for her to do that. And yet God was speaking that back then. And... And um, Stacey Campbell said something very similar. As you know, back 20 years ago, almost. In fact, now over 20 years ago. You see, God speaks. He's talking about what will happen and what has to happen to us. Things had to change in our lives. Things had to change in the life of this community. For us to be that sort of description, for us to be a spiritual family, I'm talking about us, plural, all of us, to be a spiritual family, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters to the hurting and the rebellious, for that to happen, we had to change. See, when God prophesies, he's speaking about what you are to be, not what you are now. So, so we need to understand when the prophetic word comes, God is you've got to sort of ask the questions, well, okay, so what in me has to change for that to occur? That's one of the things we've learned about. That's what the apostolic brings to the prophetic. It helps the prophetic become a building ministry, not just a, you know, here you've got a blessing, everyone gets excited because they've got a prophetic word. I mean, everyone knows what happens. If we start prophesying here, everyone gets on the edge of their seats. You go to any church, any meeting, someone's prophesying, or well, people are, everyone wants a prophecy. But it's interesting. That quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, isn't it? Action springs not from a thought, but from willing to take responsibility. See, are we willing to take the responsibility of what God's spoken over us? Now, I know we are, and that's the part. So, so what we're going to be doing, um, Mary and I are, are, are working through, and they'll work through in teams, but we're just gathering together all the prophetic words and getting clarity on what God is saying to us and what he says about us as well. There's some wonderful things he's saying about us, but then... What are the things that God requires us to do? That's what, that's what we need to do. And then we need to work through the things like, um, so that's why we get clarity of the command. And we say, okay, where's the momentum and where's there's not momentum? And, and I know it's in my head because I can see it that's come out of other words and what's coming out on Sunday nights is, 
is these, if you like, high-end words, then there's all this supporting words coming through. And then there's all these things along the way that where we've got a part to play, where you mentioned you feel like you're drifting, and yet you can actually see, hey, there's a part to play. I'll give you one example. God's spoken to us about worship, and he's spoken to us about children. And he said to us, I'm going to send you many young people from children to young adults. And then he said a couple of weeks ago, he said, for goodness sake, would you get a move on and get the children activated in worship because nothing happens with youth until you get the children done. Now, how many people here will be able to play a part in that? You see, it mightn't be. I'm not just saying, oh, it's Marcy and Kevin and Dan and Justin and Beck. It could be anyone in, in all sorts of different. You've got to start to see what's required <coughs> to make that happen. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to see where we can be doing our bits so that it's not just higgledy-piggledy. See, if I just look at, otherwise, if I get overwhelmed and say, what can we do about helping, you know, supporting what Dr. Woodroff's doing because it's all too big for us. But we do what got our part that God's called us to do as part of this overall goal of raising up a finishing generation to walk off this earth. See, it doesn't take much. He talk about momentum. See that? For something half that size, Justin and I lost our momentum on the deck on Tuesday. Something half that size. Because we had to stop what we were doing, go down to Bunnings to buy one of these. And then, of course, the heat was coming. So what we were planning on doing didn't happen. That, just that, that half that stopped the momentum. You think of a big heavy truck. We'll call it a Mack truck because God spoke to us about we've got to be in a Mack truck. You can get a brick to stop a Mack truck from moving. Doesn't take much. So we're going to look and say, what, where don't we have momentum and what's stopping us? Is there a brick here or a brick there? We've got to pull out to, to get the momentum going. So it'll often be these little things, but all the time knowing God's already said to us, now listen, guys, let me timetable your life. That'll give us this a moment. That'll give us momentum. That'll give us momentum. And remember what Doc said? talking in reference to what God's saying, see, when you do the will of him who sent you, you have his authority. We will have authority. We will have capacity as we do what God's asked us to do. Okay, so if God's asked us to do something, we do it. That's what will give us the capacity, the authority, the ability, and everything else because we do what God's asked us to do, not because what we want to do. Now, remember, this is scalable. This applies in your life. This is not, this is not a, a vision talk for the church. This works out in your life. Because as it's working out in your life, it's going to work out in the church. It's no good saying, oh, we go to this church and this church does everything that God wants, but at home we do what we want. So it goes right down to every aspect of your life. That should be a great encouragement for us all. And you're right, yes, you do need to. When we get this set up, you do need to download it and go over. I, I was surprised. I've known all this stuff for years and know about it. And you look at it again, you go, whoa, whoa. Because it's such a powerful truth. Such a powerful truth. But no, just, just to reassure you, Doc is very intense and very focused, but he's also very funny. Uh, well, don't worry if you've sat in. Sometimes he'll come in, he'll be tired. He says, oh, don't know what I feel like talking today. And he'll just start off like this and he'll start cracking jokes. And he'll half an hour just be cracking jokes. And, and the funny thing is, though, not the funny, the interesting thing is every joke and every story he tells has a purpose. He can draw on later on. He just doesn't sit up cracking jokes. He doesn't read the thousand one funny jokes and crack those. Anyway. Sorry to disturb you. No. Um, we have a feast to celebrate. Because all this, remember, we're doing the will of him who sent us. We're actually following in the apostolic footsteps of Jesus because Jesus said, I've come.
to do my father's will. This was his father's will. It's, it's, it's a good thing to be reminded about this because, because I'm saying to you, God is asking, well, God is saying to us, and I'm passing the message on, don't blame me, I'm just the messenger. God has said he wants to be the timetable of your life. He wants to arrange how you spend your days and your weeks and your months and your years. Now, I, I'm scared even, not scared, scared, but I've got a certain hesitancy even in saying that because I know that that means it'll mess, mess us up. But it'll be good messing up. But this is what Jesus did. This is how he got messed up. This is what this represents. He got messed up this much. And that's... That's, we have to be prepared to be messed up this amount. That's what we're talking about. See, to partake in this, we're really saying, Lord Jesus, we're happy to be messed up just like this. No, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm quite happy to do it. You see, I want to take all your plans. Sorry, Kevin, I know you've just vacuumed this. But I want to take all your plans, all your thoughts, and I want them to be surrendered to me. It might just be messed up. You're looking younger every day, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> Must be coming here and getting all that coffee, is it? Messed up, messed up. Enjoy the messed up meal we're having this morning. Serious stuff, this. <coughs> it's interesting, isn't it, when you put it in the context of, okay, you know, oh, yes, death to self and all that is often just a concept. But what about when this is death to self, when your plans and my plans get messed up? When what's my priority and God says, well, I've got a better idea. I have something else. Another way. See, we don't have to be scared about it because we actually took this journey back from May 1998, when we said, God, the church is yours. We've survived that so far, haven't we? Haven't we? We've, we've survived. We've come through okay. Didn't kill anybody. Upset a few plans. Changed a few things. Changed some priorities. Gave us a few headaches. Gave Kevin a few grey hairs. We're still here. And better for it. So we say that this morning, Lord, we recognize that, that, that you were prepared to allow the Father who sent you to be the timetable of your life. I mean, you think about it. I'm interrupting the prayer. You think about it. You're going up to Jerusalem? Nah. You guys go up. I'm waiting here. Next minute, he's up to Jerusalem. 
Did he change his mind? No, no, no. Just waiting till the father said to go. Mother comes out and says, do something. Do something about this wine, this situation. The guests are embarrassed. Do something. What's it to me? Woman? Yet on the cross, it says to John, John, behold your mother. In reference to his mother. God's timetable. Healed some people, didn't heal others. Raised some people from the dead, didn't raise others. He's his mates, one of his best mates is dying. So let's chill out here for a while. Waits four days. God's his timetable. Looked up and said, timetable, no, no, stay where you are. Lazarus is dying. It's okay. Stay where you are. That's how he did life. Calling us to do the same. Lord Jesus, we can talk this way because what you did empowers us, enables us to do it. Lord, as we partake of this biscuit representing your body and we drink this juice representing the blood that you allowed to be spilt, we tell you again this morning, Lord, we want to thank you. We honour you for this. And we know that, Lord, this is the same pathway you've called us to walk down. So, Lord, as we partake this morning, we really do celebrate you and embrace you. And for the joy set before us, Lord, we embark upon, continue to embark upon and press into the path that you've called us to walk down. Amen. Let's eat and drink together. <clears throat>